here and thank you very much to the organizers to give me once again the opportunity to be in this nice institute. I really, I think it's a very good initiative. So my talk is will be divided essentially into parts, one today, another tomorrow. Uh, today, I will speak a bit uh, about uh, mainly ideas about the information scrambling, quantum chaos, and intrinsic decoherence in many spin systems, but essentially introducing the basic concepts the basic uh, physical ideas, I don't want to go much into the mathematical details. So in order to, you will see how these um, concepts uh, have to be developed because they are a sort of different approach from the one of Felix because I'm, I'm uh, really pointing at the specific experiments and uh, taking quite uh, important. Uh, tomorrow I will speak a bit uh, about emergent phenomena on those and those systems I will be more specific and uh, new experiments that we are very much uh, uh, proud a bit um, uh, based on out of time order correlations and Loschmitteko where we we think we sort of prove that emergent uh, perturbation independent irreversibility so I'm from Cordoba which is the center of Argentina this is and uh, we have an Institute of Physics Enrique Gaviola here it is Gaviola and I put uh, his photo here because I always uh, try to, to keep in mind uh, historical uh, background because it's what inspires me. This is uh, my thesis advisor, Arturo Lopez Dávalo, and we are here in Córdoba. And in Córdoba, in this place, which is a, an abandoned hotel in the, in the, in the, in the hills, is, is where the first Argentinian and Brazilian physicists studied quantum mechanics. That's, uh, that's in, the, in, the, in the 40s, uh, not, uh, yes, in the 40s. There was, uh, um, at the time, the, the founder of our Institute of Physics, which is Enrique Gaviola here, invited Guido Beck. So maybe you know him, he was for a while and he uh, passed away in Brazil, in Centro Brasileiro de Pesquisas Físicas. He was a refugee from Europe, from the, the Nazi Europe, and he was brought, uh, say, from a, from a prison in Portugal by this, uh, by Gabiola. And so they meet there with the first, uh, I, I think, uh, Nussensweig was one, one of the Brazilian physicists to, who, who learned quantum mechanics there. And all, all uh, uh, of Argentinian physicists uh, really started there. Um, so, Guido Beck was um, essentially did his thesis with Hans Turing in Vienna, and he actually was the first to prove the solution of gravitational waves, cylindrical, before Einstein. At the time, Einstein was not convinced that gravitational waves uh, were existent. And actually, he was the context for my thesis advisor to do the, his own thesis at Vienna with uh, Walter Turing, Hans' uh, son who did the uh, thesis with Schrodinger, who did the thesis with Hasselhoff, who did the thesis with Boltzmann. And that's why I, how I got the ideas and the questions that I'm going to try to post. And with my experimental and theoretical work, I tried to, to solve in a way. So there were questions that were presented to me when I was at the, the course of um, uh, quantum theory of, uh, of matter. And essentially, that's uh, what I'm going to repeat a bit. So essentially, you know that uh, uh, Boltzmann was presenting his demonstration of uh, H theorem, that entropy always increase, uh, on the basis of uh, his hypothesis, hypothesis of molecular chaos, which is essentially <laughs> the precedent of our the chaos that we are studying currently. And when during his presentation, I mean, he was saying, uh, I, we have a two two kind of molecules in a box and we separate them and then they are going to mix and this was his demonstration on the basis of classical mechanics but then there were two strong objections to his demonstration one of them was pointed by Sermelo uh, invoking a Poincaré theorem saying that mechanics is always cyc cyc cyclic so Poincaré cycles everything is going to be recurrent because 
Finally, all systems are finite, and that was the idea of a Poincaré cycle. And another objection was raised by Loschmidt, who said that, that mechanics is reversible. Not, uh, not only period, but reversible. So a system can go from apparent disorder to order simply by inverting the momentum for the particles in, this, in that gas. gas. So there really were strong uh, objections, so uh, Boltzmann had to reformulate his initial presentation. And the point is that uh, the, the answer to, to Loschmidt was, then you do it. And essentially, these those questions were somehow solved or not, it depends on uh, who uh, uh, the point of view, but essentially, that's, uh, uh, they, they were very, very important. And the idea of Loschmidt of reversing the, the dynamics is what gives rise to the idea of a Loschmidt demon, a sort of uh, cousin of uh, Maxwell demons, a being whose faculties are so sharpened that he can follow every molecule in its course. Of course, I call it a, a demon with this, which is a genius. It's not a, a, a evil uh, being, but uh, it's just a genius, a spirit. That's uh, that's uh, I use this 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 name. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, not right. That's so we, we are going to see the experiments that we actually go back in time and then we go into negative times. But that that's uh, the let's let's see what's going on. So essentially, when I was, uh, I was doing my uh, postdoc with uh, Patrick uh, Lee and Boris Altschuler at MIT, and I received the offer to come back to Argentina to, to a new equipment, an NMR spectrometer, and I saw that w I act we could do actually these experiments of uh, Boltzmann and an NMR spectrometer that I conceived at the time as my quantum computer. And I'm going to show uh, why it is that. Imagine that we have two spins, it will be nuclear spins, they are interacting. So because of the interaction, they will uh, switch uh, uh, spin projections. And this is essentially what you do by Wigner short and transformations. Essentially, you can, instead of spins, you can think in, or in, in terms of fermions or bosons, and a particle is jumping from one side to the other. So essentially, the flip-flop processes in spins are hoppings of electrons, and the icing interactions is a Havard term, uh, nearest neighbor Havard term. And that's why, essentially, at the point, at the time when I was taking the decision to come back, an experiment appeared, done by uh, Richard Ernst, and essentially a uh, Nobel Prize in the development of NMR equipment. And uh, let's consider a solid state uh, sample. Let's consider that we have up spins here and down spins there, or particles and holes. That's just a cartoon to imagine and somehow order initial situation. I have an interaction. This interaction is going to produce the sort of diffusion, the spreading of this excitation which was initially localized. And essentially, this is what this complex many body interaction is what typically was known in NMR and EPR, all these magnetic resonances, was known as spin diffusion. And the experiment that has appeared at the time in 1992, when it was the time to come back, was essentially done with the same spectrometer that we had in Cordoba, by, the, I say, the Richard Nair Nobel, Nobel Prize, and this was this, this experiment. And essentially, what is in a, in a, in a crystal where the essential, the, the units were with these circles, with uh, spins that are interacted with nearby circles. And what he obtained, it was essentially, he put a, a polarization in the in, in initial site and asked what is the, pro uh, the, the probability that the polarization survives. And he obtained a scale, an exponential, 
seems quite consistent with this idea of spin diffusion, and an asymptotic value to one fifth. And so he said, okay, it seems that the spreading is occurs within this five-fold ring, no, no farther away. So more, more or less consistent. So the other molecules are acting like an environment, more or less, but essentially will, di will diffuse. So when I saw the experiment, say, I, we have to go there, we have to do the experiments, because I don't believe this experiment. Why I don't believe? Two things. Short times, this is an exponential. There is no quantum evolution that starts as an exponential. Quantum evolution has, has to start as a quadratic law. So they say they will spread into the five-fold rings. If it's actually a five-fold ring, the dynamics, then you will see the Poincaré recurrences, which are not there. What is happening? So it's a good question. So we decided to go, go back to Argentina with my wife. She was an experimentalist, but the experimentalist in EPR. So we both had to learn about NMR and do the, this experiment. So essentially, one interesting thing about uh, uh, NMR, and that's what is essentially, why it is a essentially a quantum computer, you have a, a, a system, but essentially you can turn on and off the interactions as you wish, quite at desire. So you can build your Hamiltonians on and off, you can do switch and, and you do many things. That you have a really a quantum computer where you can put an initial state more or less as you wish with certain limitations. So everything, because you do pulse, uh, radio frequency uh, pulses. So let's consider, in order to understand this experiment, let's say, I, I thought, okay, let's consider that we have a ring of spins, they are interacting, let's say flip-flop interaction. They will have also a, 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 an easing term, which is ZZ interaction. So essentially, if you, I go to the, to the fermion formalism, just flip-flop interaction, just go into a hopping term, and the easing interaction will go into uh, uh, this uh, many-body term where you have four fermion operators. So density, density, interaction, four den uh, fermion operators, as you see. So essentially, you will expect that all the dynamics to be controlled by the shape, the, the interaction that you will have. If you consider, for example, that that's, uh, was a very important thing uh, uh, in the, that your experiments are at, ha at infinite temperature. So here the, the, the temperature is actually infinite. Why it is infinite? Because temperature is much, much higher than the interaction uh, uh, strength that you have here. Much, much higher. So in that case, I assume that you don't have these many body terms that uh, I will take uh, treat later perturbatively if I need. So essentially, my initial ex excitation can be mapped into a vacuum and uh, having a spin up, since all of them are half of them up, half of them down. So my excitation is only the, 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 the spin that is up, and the other can be th uh, thought as a vacuum, because there is no, no excitation in the other thing. So in that case, the probability, if I put the excitation at a single site and see whether it survives there, is essentially a tight binding, a one-body dynamics. So where I, I have the, the state in a state one, I make it to evolve, just a tight binding Hamiltonian. I ask whether it is at, at position n at a later time. This is a sort of experiment that will correspond to this uh, Ernst experiment there. And then, since I'm mapping, if I'm dealing with a linear chain, it is clear that here I should see recurrences. Because it's a finite system, I will have a finite number of uh, frequencies. So essentially, I have mapped my many-body problem into a single-body problem because the actual many-body interactions have been neglected. So let me, so just to introduce the, not the notation, what we, are, we will be able to measure is a time-ordered correlation function. Let's imagine. I have this thermal state, many-body states. Half of them, the spins are up, half are down. So I create an excitation at the initial time, at the initial, an initial position one. I make it to evolve with the Hamiltonian. And I ask whether this excitation is at, at uh, position n at a later time t of the evolution. 
since uh, this is a, so I, it is a field operator, I have to introduce also here the, uh, the other term in, in the evolution. And this is my time order correlation function that I should be able to evolve, to, to, to obtain. Uh, it will correspond, that was the decay that was observed as a function of time that was observed by Ernst in, in the ring, will be correspond this. You have the excitation at a single side and will decay as a function of time. But since the system is finite, uh, is finite and essentially there is no many body interaction, what you're going to see is that the excitation actually goes to the, to the inner part of the chain gets to the other edge of the chain, gets reflected, and gets back as a mesoscopic echo. So I got the idea of mesoscopic echo just at the time from, uh, uh, yes, Boris Altschuler was developing this theory of, uh, so the I have as many uh, energies, energies as uh, the number of spins that I have here. That's uh, that's in, that's uh, in this it is 20. So the frequencies is 20. The so the, so you have to do the frequencies that you combine 20 energies eigenvalue, because you reduce this to the single particle excitation. No, 20 independent energies. So frequencies you have to connect all these these energies to make the frequencies. Those are the the, the things. So that's what we have been observing here. No, 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 that's a, 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 a bit of spreading because it's not a perfect Poincaré cycle here, but essentially it's a, that's essentially, this is a theory, okay? That's uh, what I wanted to see, how you will expect to observe in a, in a, in a single system. So anyway, that's I in a point at that time was a quite a surprise in, in NMR that you could, could observe something, the, our prediction that you could observe something like this, because people were expecting uh, spin diffusion immediately. So we did the experiment, and this is actually the, the, the molecule that corresponds to the crystal that Ernst was doing. Essentially, that, that's a ferrocene molecule. Our spins are the proton spins here. They, they are in rings of five form. They interact with the ne nearest uh, neighbor rings. So there is a, a whole many body system when uh, um, with a macroscopic number of, of, of spins. So essentially, the experiments could be done as, as follows. We use a carbon-13 here to inject the polarization into a single, so only one in a, in a hundred carbons are magnetic carbons. So we will use this single magnetic carbon to inject the, the excitation in a single thing, and as a local probe, and also, also as, a, as, a, as a probe to detect later on whether the excitation is still there. And then, this is what we obtain in this uh, situation. The, the excitation is here with probability one. It decays, you see, with a quadratic law. And this goes back, and you have these oscillations that this will correspond to this uh, mesoscopic echo. Of course, in this system, our interaction is dipolar interaction. In dipolar interaction, we have flip uh, flop processes, and also is in interaction. So there is a many-body interaction that acts as a decoherent source to, to reduce this peak, and also the interaction with the nearest uh, neighbor rings acts as a sort of decoherence through, uh, to, the single, um, to the single ring. So essentially, ex excitation spreads to the other rings, so that's why you don't get the, the peak. If you will have an isolated ring that's what you will have, uh, uh, this will be your mesoscopic echo here. That's, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, the theory, and this was the surprise, and this was uh, quite uh, surprising. In this system, for example, it's another molecule that we did in immediately. We have uh, just the five-fold rings are more isolated because there is uh, more longer distances before it sees another ring, and then you have the, the oscillations a uh, bit more uh, pronounced. I mean, in order to obtain the gout, uh, the, the, the what, was the, what was the problem? In order to obtain the, the, the quadratic decay here, we have really to do a time reversal experiment. So 
we have to start the experiment in the negative times in order to see how the actual dynamics start. It seems that the Ernst experiment, he had missed the evolution of the initial times. So what we did, we had the excitation to make it to evolve backward in times, and then we do forward in times in order to see this, what Chirikov was <laughs> saying. So we're using that the diffusion works both forward and backward to obtain the zero times here. Immediately, then Richard Ernst, I can realize he was very happy with this experiment, and then he did uh, himself the experiment in a, in a, now in a liquid. In a liquid, he could get um, a liquid. The uh, important thing is that since the liquid rotates permanently so fastly, they is isolate from other molecules. So essentially, that's what in a liquid you can do a single molecule experiment. So he created, he put this um, lysine molecule where you have the carbon atoms, not the protons, the, which are the mag uh, enriched carbon-13, so he created the excitation at the first, uh, at the edge, and as a function of time, he, s he saw that it decays. Then look at the second at, uh, nuclei, and see the excitation went to the second nuclei, then to the third, to the fourth, this is time, gets reflected, as in our plot, at the edge, goes back, and gets back as a mesoscopic echo. So essentially, it was the first quantum chain where you can transfer quantum information. You can create whatever state you want here. Uh, it could be an excitation, could be a superposition between up and down, and this superposition will spread forth and back along the chain. That's uh, essentially the, the experiment. OK. As I mentioned already, uh, we did this sort of time reversal. What is the, the key of time reversal? The key of time reversal is essentially uh, was already in the experiment of Han echo or of um, or spin echo, what is are calling uh, like this. In those experiments, you have initial, let's see, you have initial many spins which are oriented along the magnetic field. You give them a pulse, but every spin feels a different uh, magnetic field because of the, the local environment. You give them again a pulse. And essentially, you make all those spins to evolve backwards, and you get an echo in the magnetization. But what you are reverting there is the evolution of these individual spins in the presence of the magnetic fields that are evolving at different uh, rates. That's essentially what you are seeing there. So essentially, what you are evolving is an individual evolution of a single body system. That's the, the Han echo. So essentially, but the, the main idea that already was caught by, by Han is that actually you are doing the time reversal by changing the sign of the Hamiltonian, which you do there by inverting the spins. You could do inverted the, 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 the magnetic field, what, whatever. But this was the key idea to, this, to, to fight this Loschmidt uh, proposal, to change the Hamiltonian into minus the Hamiltonian. And this is what essentially we try to implement in these dipolar systems, uh, which are many real many body systems. Essentially, again, we will have this many body system. We will make it to evolve forward in time. Then we will change, essentially, something in the Hamiltonian and make it to evolve backward in time to the originally ordered state. That was our expectation, at least. Now, what would be, if th that is the case, Essentially, again, we will have the thermal state in the whole sample, microscopic sample. We will create the single excitation in the, in the spin, uh, proton spin, which is nearby to the carbon-13. We make it to evolve in time, and then we make it to evolve backward in time by changing the sign of the Hamiltonian. Okay, we accept that we always have a small error in our Hamiltonian, and then we put this sigma that school corresponds to the the part that you were not able to control the Hamiltonian, but this part is a really a small percentage of the whole Hamiltonian. That's a, a very small part. And then you detect, you ask whether you went back, for example, to your initial state because you are using your carbon-13 to detect the excitation. And this is essentially what is defined as the Loschmidt echo. That's what, uh, what our experiment was measuring. And essentially, this is an out-of-time order correlation. 
because in order to measure this correlation function, you have to do a time reversal to change the sign of the Hamiltonian. That was the first out of time order correlation functions that we are going to see later on in, in a different uh, context. So let me show what, how do we change the Hamiltonian into the minus the Hamiltonian? Just because it is dipolar interaction, two dipoles repel each other, but you rotate all the spins, they attract each other. Those attract each other, but you rotate the spins and they repel each other. So just by rotating all the spins simultaneously by, by a pulse, you change the sign of the Hamiltonian. And this is what the, the decay that we were observing before. At this time, we invert the, the Hamiltonian, and we get a reversal of the magnetization, but still, we don't get the initial one value. Okay, you say. Still, we were expecting not getting the, 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 the whole one, but essentially it was a, a bit smaller than what we expected. So we did a, a, a very serious uh, experiments in many systems and situations in order to try to get a, a smaller errors that we could get. And also having bigger errors by putting magnetic impurities and so on. So this is essentially the strength of the echo, that's the Loschmidt echo, your, uh, the, 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 the amount of excitation you get back at the initial site. So you look that you're looking at the initial site. So among the system that I'm not going to mention, but there were ferrocene, cementine, uh, ferrocene put in, uh, in carbon-13, liquid crystals, because liquid crystals are finite systems essentially that remain essentially isolated, also one-dimensional systems, uh, and quite a, quite a number of experiments. From all the experiments, I, I just going to draw this, this main result. In situations where the, where the perturbations is very, very small, we tend to see that the loss will decay with a sort of Gaussian, and this Gaussian, in that case, there is, I we will say the interaction with the, uh, the interaction time with the environment will be much longer than the typical many-body time scale, which is fixed by the second moment of the Hamiltonian, by Shea. The interaction, that's what fixes this many-body dynamics. When cases where we put magnetic impurities, for example, where we have a, an interaction with the environment, which is very short, in that case, we will see an exponential, which is controlled uh, by, by actually this interaction with the environment, and we won't see any relation with the, uh, with the Hamiltonian itself. Essentially, we will call the time scale of the, of the reversal always T3 because the time scale at which uh, the, that would correspond to the many body uh, time reversal, while T2 is uh, typically called to the Haneko time scale. This is a new time scale that comes from the many body reversal. And most of the results in those various systems that I show ended up. In, in this, in this uh, we have T2, which is essentially the time scale of the flip-flop interaction. That's essentially what is being measured, what uh, limits the Han echo is limited, because uh, remember, Han echo is a one-body procedure. So many-body interactions is the time scale that limits this procedure. This is T2. Now we are measuring T3. We don't know what limits the, the, the many body uh, time reversal. This is, uh, so the, the rate of the reversibility as a function of the, the, the residual intera interaction strength that we have here with tau sigma, more or less most of, of the experiments ended up here. There are very samples, very different uh, situations, seeing that typically you will see T3 the time scale of the irre many body irreversibility more or less scales with a one body irreversibility being a longer time, let's say at, uh, uh, a factor of four, five, bigger, and seems to scale to a finite value. And this makes me to remember that, uh, for example, a curve of um, conductance as a function of temperature in a disorder metal. In a disorder metal, you know that the resistance is uh, controlled by the concentration of impurities. 
But you know that the concentration of the impurities, you have elastic scattering. There is no irreversibility in the elastic uh, collision with the impurity. But still, it's what, what uh, controls your dissipation. When you go down with the, with the temperature, you go into this uh, intrinsic uh, uh, residual resistance, which is controlled by the, by the, by the impurities. But essentially, it was Laughlin who points in one of the papers that essentially you must think a mean free path as a Lyapunov of time, uh, the Lyapunov of length of uh, an electron moving in, in an impurity bath. And essentially, that residual resistance is essentially a property of chaotic system, of the chaotic electronic system, the chaos uh, produced by the dynamics in presence of, impure, in, of an impure system. So essentially, we thought this connection between this sort of asymptotic time scale that we will have here, instead what we will expect for a single molecule, in connection with chaos and with the, with the residual resistance here. So essentially we observe, I mean as a, as a hint here, I'm going to show a better proof uh, tomorrow, that we got a sort of perturbation independent decay, which is not affected by errors, that, that will be uh, strong errors, Weak errors, errors are, are very weak. The time scale of the of the, of the of your interaction with the environment or what your errors is very long. You get the asymptotic result, and that's where when I started the, this idea of the, I, I mean again uh, of the rotating mixer. You will think I have a column here. Uh, you know uh, probably all, all of you know the, this experiment. You have two cylinders. Uh, you have a, a liquid here, glycerin and a, an ink. You turn on the, the, the handle and you go back with the handle, come back to the initial site. That's okay, but this is as long as you don't do many turns in, the, in, the, in, the, in this here. Because if you do many turns, then you put this, this ink, uh, the, 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 the folding very close together and thought that you make it the irre irreversible process is very efficient. In that case, you will not be able to go back. And that's the idea how chaos enters in this irreversibility, I, I, will, th I will think. So ca chaos produces this folding, this mixing, that makes every slight process very, very efficient. And you will see as a time scale, the time scale of this uh, turning on this, this experiment. So essentially, going back to this analogy with uh, an electron uh, in presence of impurities is a Lorentz gas. Uh, as I mentioned, my Loschmitteko in the one-body version will become an initial wave packet that evolves in this Hamiltonian and then evolves back in presence of a perturbation. Here, the perturbation could be a change in the effective mass in 100%, uh, uh, a very small change in the effective mass, and you ask whether it can back to the initial state, and you ask for the square. This is essentially what corresponds to the one-body version of our many-body experiment. So in that situation, you have this evolution. You see that you go into very complicated, uh, a short time, uh, um, dynamics. Then you make backward in time dynamics. And you don't get back to the initial side. So essentially, the Loschmitteko is the overlap between these two things. And essentially, this is the uh, Loschmitteko, my, my way to, to measure the dynamics. To in the, in, the, in, the, in the Hamiltonian. And this is the idea that has to replace, essentially, the idea of instability with respect to changes in the initial condition. Uh, you could compare, us, uh, of course, with the fidelity, which is uh, the evolution with one Hamiltonian and with other Hamiltonian. But I, I think it's always better to compare with the Loschmitteko because it's easier here. And the essential point, I will not go into details. Perhaps tomorrow I ha have more time. Essentially, to understand this experiment, we uh, develop this uh, dynamic situation in terms of Feynman, Feynman path integrals. And essentially, uh, say here are classical paths that are associated with this wave packet. And with this, we were able to connect, with, uh, together with Rodolfo Chalaber, uh, to connect this Loschmitteko to the classical instability of the, of the classical trajectories uh, that were underlying the quantum dynamics. I will not go into the, the details because I want to keep into the concept.
sigma was a change uh, in the in the in the picture was a change in the effective mass. If you uh, have a tie binding Hamiltonian with, uh, with a square lattice, one of the hoppings you change it 100 percent, for example. Yes, once it is very small, but once it scatters, it's very efficient again in 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 preventing the reversal. So for this case, which is the Lorentz mass, we plot the uh, the Loschmidt echo as a function of time, and we observe for various uh, sizes of this uh, big Lorentz uh, gas, and we always saw that it scales down with the same uh, Lyapunov exponent that will correspond to the classical system here. This is in the, in the, in the case. So an interesting thing is that uh, you have a, we have a bigger system, as uh, this is a small system, a bigger system, a bigger system, and a bigger system. So keeps going down as we make the system uh, bigger. That's why it says the RMFS time so it's a certain first time will correspond as uh, my interpretation is when um, um, a perturbation to trajectory starts at the distance with um, with a wavelength uh, now end up in different sides of the um, of the collision side of the sphere. That's a length that essentially uh, now your your wave packet approximation will no longer be valid uh, at this time. So it goes far beyond the the, the wavelength. But of course, th there is a, 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 a thing. So my perturbation has to be bigger than something. There is a critical value here. In order to reach, this is the time, the time scales of these exponentials. So if I'm for mis perturbation, for example, the change in the effective mass is time to the minus 2, I have to be, for bigger, I see the Lyapunov exponent. If it is too small, it is, uh, the perturbation is not enough to mix. The, the, the states, and then you will see a Fermi golden rule. It mixes, but still not so, so, so evenly. So it's a Fermi golden rule that you see is well described by the sort of uh, perturbation and uh, local strength function uh, and so on. But essentially, we have this perturbation independent regime in this one body uh, situation. So, now the, these things uh, are getting uh, quite uh, it's interesting because it's getting uh, interesting because very related things are now uh, related to information scrambling and it is related to this Maldacena stuff of uh, black holes. So I'm not a specialist on this, so I will uh, apologize, but I'm going to, to repeat some things that I'm learned so my, from my son, from, uh, from Maldacena, that's my daughter. So they are at Stanford. My son at the time was at Pasadena, uh, Juan Martin. My daughter in Buenos Aires. So very delocalized, but still entangled. And essentially, uh, I got this invitation from uh, Alexei Kitayev, who explained the things, various things, <laughs> that took me quite a, a while to, to, to more or less digest. And I'm going to comment on his, uh, more or less, his own words. That's a, I, I, I rub uh, some pictures from, from, from Aldacena. So essentially, in the, what they, they are saying is the following. If uh, one mass falls into a black hole, then it goes, is going to increase the area of the black hole in some amount. That's according to relativity, uh, Einstein relativity. So they make the relation between this mass with energy and then to the area of the black hole they associate it with the entropy. And then the coefficient that you have here, which is the gravity constant, and the, the gravity with the, with the thermodynamics. So let's, let's see again a bit of the, of the plot. So essentially, what what they think is that because uh, this this entropy is like uh, like in the uh, Planck's radiation uh, uh, deduction of the radiation black body radiation law, he has to introduce the quantum to 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 a uh, quantum to to prove the radiation. The same in order to prove that you have an entropy here, you have you need a quantum of information. And essentially, what is the quantum of information? If you if you think that you have a mass of the order of the of the Earth, which is uh, six to the 
24, then you will have a black hole <laughs> with a radius which is uh, one centimeter, essentially. But essentially, in this black hole of one centimeter, you will have 10 to the 66 units of information that correspond to the Planck lengths that come out uh, uh, from this uh, constant here. So the Planck lengths is uh, some uh, length of the of the order of 10 to the to the minus 35, and uh, that's uh, essentially the entropy of the black hole is essentially proportional to the area divided by these uh, units, uh, the length of the uh, of the where the, the units are information units are, are stored. Essentially, you consider that that a one-dimensional black hole <laughs> with a coordinate and time. Essentially, this is the black hole radius, so your regular uh, uh, space-time is at the right. So people, in order you will go in to see this, this picture, so that's why I want to, to, to make this, this connection. Instead of uh, thinking this uh, regular coordinate, th they go into these transform coordinates, where essentially uh, this is uh, what corresponds to the black hole uh, radius. The times then are these lines here, the, 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 the blue lines, and these are different distances from the black hole. This is the physical region of the, the phase space in, this, uh, in their picture, so you're going to see these triangles typically in, the, in, the, in those pictures. That's what they, they consider. Essentially, what they, what they think is essentially this is be these coordinates. This is the, the you have a this one-dimensional black hole. It is essentially uh, this is the, the black hole radius, and they consider an anti-sitter space. An anti-sitter space is a, a space that where uh, uh, the cosmological constant is negative. So it is negative or positive. It is contracting, so ne nothing is escapes. So they consider that since nothing will escape, you could put a boundary here. That's what they say. A black hole in a box, because it's an anti-de-sitter space that is contracting, so nothing is going to escape to infinity. Mm? And the essential point is that uh, that they observe is if you think as a, as a mechanical system, it's a very unstable system, because I, I might wait to think about the black hole. So you have a particle that is uh, just in the surface of the black hole with enough energy to escape just with enough energy to escape. If you give a, a little more energy to a particle nearby, the both particles will start uh, separating each other because they feel very different uh, attractions. So essentially, there, there is a sort of instability there, mechanical instability, because two uh, initial trajectories which are very, uh, particles start very close end up very, very, very far away. And the instability, uh, uh, scale is just the gravity at the surface of the black, black hole. I think of it as a, a essentially like an inverted harmonic oscillator. You have two, two particles there, they start very far, but they go away. Uh, that's uh, the, the simple instability that I could, could think. And then they, they, they think essentially that, uh, uh, that so they, they say, okay, they, this uh, something that uh, people in this high energy and relativity say, Black hole is the most chaotic uh, object in the universe. That's uh, very unstable. That's uh, what they have to say. But then, the gravity force at the surface of the, grand, uh, uh, the black hole is proportional to the temperature because of that uh, that uh, relation between energy and entropy that you have there. Essentially, temperature and instability coefficients are essentially the same at the surface of the grand black hole. Then the point is that you have to, to deal with the, uh, mal, um, uh, with the idea of a holography of T. Hoft. Hoft said that essentially an object that uh, a number of dimension and plus time, at, uh, 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 which is a quantum object, will be corresponding to, to a gravity theory with one, plus, uh, one more spatial dim dimension and time. And this was transformed to Maldacena conjecture, actually, to make a correspondence between a quantum field theory 
and a gravity in this anti de space that we'll uh, consider here. So they consider, essentially, this could be the, the radius of the black hole. This is essentially the box where you put, because you, you are into the sitter space, you, make, you have a quantum theory that essentially uh, uh, here, that leaps in, in a single radius but at different times, then will correspond to a whole uh, description of uh, space and time inside with gravity. That's uh, what they, they expect, this, this correspondence between um, it's a holographic correspondence between uh, quantum field theory and the gravity. So they wanted to say, in a way, here, this theory has to be chaotic, because the classical theory has to be chaotic nearby the black hole. So you need, in a way, a theory that is chaotic here. So they started to try to define what is chaotic, and they tried to define in correlations functions, very uh, um, complicated here, at uh, two times, in order to try to define KO. And it is essentially, uh, let me come, come back here, essentially in order to show what is going to be measured. The main idea then, they were, they were already calculating these correlation functions, quite complicated, until Kitaev again came back. Kitaev re remember one of the uh, talk by, by, by Larkin, I think, and where he publicized uh, an old result he has, again, in this order, electrons in a disordered metal that is going to be a uh, superconductor. Electrons in a disordered metal, the same model as, as I mentioned before. So since electrons are chaotic because of the scattering with the impurities, they will think, again, how does it change the, the, the momentum when you change a bit the initial position? You expect that this is going to increase with a sort of Lyapunov exponent. Forget about this h bar. This is a classical result that they expected to occur in an for electrons in an impure system. Now, if you do the quantum version, you put the, uh, the, the you multiply by the h bar and h bar, and this will correspond to 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 a commutator. So the Poisson brackets go into the commutator with momentum at zero at zero time and momentum at zero uh, uh, at time t. So essentially, since this, you are not sure that it's going to increase or decrease, you don't have a, a defined sign. Instead of studying, studying this, you st study the square of this quantity. The square of this quantity, of this commutator. And this is the out-of-time order correlated. That's something that is the square of a, a physical uh, quantity that essentially is going to move, uh, to, to measure how depend, uh, how the position, uh, final uh, momentum depends on changing the initial condition. But you also can look at it uh, in the following way. You have an initial, uh, this um, a momentum operator, and you're going to see whether it commutes with a, with a momentum at a later time. Since if, if this is momentum in some coordinate which is not mixed with this, this uh, coordinate k, this, uh, you may consider that initially they commute these two operators. But as uh, times goes on, they stop commuting because the, the, the system is evolving into a more complex state. That's uh, the basic idea. Then you're going to see that this commutator, actually the, the, the square of it, is going to increase exponentially. This is, I, I took the, from this uh, transparency by, by Kitaev, where he would say, okay, this is the Loschmitekov. So <laughs> Well, that's really an idea of Larkin of Chinikov. That's uh, we are going to see. There, th this is discussion, but this is the basic idea to introduce this commutator. And it was a very physical, just a portion in, in the paper. They obtain uh, an analytical solution for that case in the case of impure uh, of, of, uh, of an impure metal, and this uh, was essentially with the with the, um, the the commutator was increasing with. Um, uh, with a time scale that relates to the mean free path, essentially, as you expect. And essentially, okay, you transform this, uh, then the people in, in, in high energy transform this operator in whatever operator, in general, they speak out of time order correlated to, to speak about more general things, which may or may not be chaotic. So essentially, that's a, it's a hint in a one, um, 
a single body particle system that going now to try to extrapolate to a many body case because you think that essentially this uh, qubit in this space uh, in the uh, Planck scale is equivalent to a spin in our system. So essentially you think that the whole space is a grid of qubits, interacting qubits, which, whose interaction in an emergent uh, uh, dynamics is going to give classical dynamics for the, for the big quantities. That's uh, the, the, the idea. Well, that, that's, I'm going to put my operators. I'm not going to discuss it. Or well, then let's 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 discuss what, what it is. Well, the, what they were thinking is uh, essentially here. Let, for example, here. Uh, wait, wait. Let's. Uh, le, 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 you're going to speak about your work later, and I, I'm going to speak about my work and the other people here. So essentially, for example, one of the people who who started with this with us, uh, Doug Douglas Stanford with Suskin. So there was forth and back on this on this story. So he tried to consider, I mean, what is the, the basics, uh, more basic system of qubits that he would consider was, okay, a spin chain will, will put easing interaction here, an interaction with two magnetic fields along X and along uh, Z. And he measured how uh, he has an initial state, which is essentially a single operator. You have a, a single operator, and you make it to ev evolve. And so a single spin operator, because of you have this complex Hamiltonian, will, as a function of time, will uh, create correlation with other spins, neighbor spins. And so you'll have more and more and more correlations as, a, as the time evolves. And as a, as a function of time, you're going to see that the, 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 you, you initially have a single operator, but the weight of this single operator decays and then you see the weight of two uh, body operators, or two spin operators, is increases, and then the, 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 the third and fourth. So essentially, the initial uh, information, which is a single spin operator because of the evolution, is scrambling into more and more spin systems. As occurs in our experiment. In our experiment, we have a, an excitation in a single spin, and this uh, uh, spin entangles with the neighbors, and then with the neighbors, and then with the neighbors, and you have more and more states involved, and again, uh, uh, you are uh, exploring a bigger and bigger uh, region of the Hilbert space. Here, since the, the chain is finite, like I think it's uh, 20 spin or, or, or less, so essential numbers of sites that get involved until it grows, until all the spins are involved, essentially when with an equivalent uh, growth. That's a simulation done by Stanford, who got uh, now the, this um, this uh, this price, I mean, that's an uh, interesting price. Um, uh, a couple of months ago, so let let uh, let's consider what uh, Kitayev thought about this this thing. The first thing that he considered, as uh, as, uh, as uh, everyone did, was try to consider spin systems. Systems are li like our spins. You have a one spin, another spin. They interact with the, this interaction uh, constant. You could put. Uh, all-to-all uh, -all interaction, and then the time scale is again is going to be controlled by the Shea interaction, so second moment of the Hamiltonian. But there then there was a problem. Uh, uh, so typically spin system uh, are uh, temperature much higher, as I said, at the energy scale, and in that case, just by dimensional arguments, dimensional arguments, no proof, no theor theorem here was expected that the sort of Lyapunov exponent, the time scale, will be controlled by Shea, which is much lower than T. And at very low temperatures, much uh, lower than Shea, you will expect that the system freezes into a spin glass, so we will be no longer chaotic. So breakdown uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, ergodicity, that you have here the breakdown of ergodicity. So the spin uh, model will not really work out. That's uh, found by, by uh, Kitayev. And then it's when, when he proposed a model that will uh, have more chances to show this chaos at all temperatures and, uh, and uh, at tone scales. So instead of this, these spins, he proposed, uh, remember that I saw the, 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 the easing interaction, I will have four fermions operators. He transformed those four fermions into four uh, Majorana fermions. 
So he cannot have to distinguish uh, between creation and annihilation operator. So we have more wide uh, open selection rules. He could put uh, random uh, numbers for these uh, interactions, but always controlled by the second moment, mean, uh, mean value. So it's an all to all model of Majorana fermions for, um, for particle operators. And in that cases, those, uh, th those, those uh, situations, he will obtain uh, essentially a, um, a time scale for this decays of the, this Soto co co correlation function, which is essentially controlled by the temperature, by the temperature, not by the by, by the interaction. But in my cases, I always uh, yes. Uh, no, no, they put in temperature. That's, uh, no, that's the Hamiltonian, but then you have to put the, the initial state. You, you use the Hamiltonian for a given many-body state that you create, a mixed state. So they have the temperature. So they, you put the, the, the um, Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution function for the many-body states. Use Boltzmann-Gibbs. So they, they have, uh, that's essentially standard statistical mechanics. So this is a model that could be solved because essentially in this model, the Green's function in, in this model is essentially, uh, um, is essentially the, 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 the uh, here is the Dyson equation. You can neglect this, this, this uh, the role of this Green's function, the number of Green function, and you will get a sigma self-energy, which is essentially related to uh, the, the Green's function to the third. That, that's essentially what you have here. That's uh, why uh, essentially this model could be solved. So let's just try to, to wrap up of what I have. My Loj Miteko. My Loj Miteko I have. My initial state, many body state. I also can put the temperature here what I want. One thing is my Hamiltonian, one other thing is my temperature. My temperature is my initial state. What are the distribution of my states? And uh, don't, don't worry. Uh, so the point is what I put here as an initial state. If I put a thermal state, or uh, put, uh, put a ground state, what I put. So you have a many body state here, which typically is a sort of mixed state at a given temperature. You can put a density matrix. You create an excitation. You make it to all forward in times. You make it to evolve backward in time with the perturb Hamiltonian, and you ask whether your, uh, your, your spin, your local state, is still there. That's your operator. And this you have to put in order to complete the evolution, and you have a normalized. This is essentially the Loj Miteko. But essentially, look at, look at this situation. Think as a perturbation that instead of uh, staying all the way, all the time, while you do the backward evolution, you have a perturbation that it only acts as a kick, as a very short period of time. So it's going to factorize this uh, exponential of the perturbation at the, at the given time, for the, the, this time scale. And essentially, this is what is going to be your B operator. So you have your A operator, A operator, that's one of your operators here, So I, I just write here. You have S. You have the, this you call B so uh, to the exponential of the perturbation at a, just when you are starting to do the backward in time evolution. That's something that we do, and we are going to show how we did it uh, the, next, um, the next talk. So essentially, what I'm measuring, my Loj Miteko is measuring. I have an initial state. This is A naught. That's a very clear significance. I excite my system. I put a, a mark here. I make it to evolve uh, 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 in, in time, and, uh, and, and at the time uh, t, I perturb the system. And then make this my system, uh, this is will be my perturbation, something that I do to my system. And I do the, the evolution backwards, and I ask whether my excitation is still there. So you don't have to think in, th in terms of this in order to want to see the physics. That's just to, to complete the, uh, the, the evolution. You have excite your system, make it to evolve, 
uh, perturb your system, make it evolve backward in times, and see whether the system has returned. This is what is called the um, out of time order correlation uh, function, which is essentially one part of the commutator. So the commutator divides in two parts. One of these, which has most of the time dependence, and another time, which is essentially mostly time independent, to say, uh, that corresponds to the commutators at the uh, at the different order. So essentially, most of the of the physics of the of the um, out of time order correlations is in this operator, which is a particular case of the Loge Mitekos, as I'm going to show experiments uh, uh, next time, and we are going to use this to see how the excitation scrambles over the whole system. So es essentially, I'm going to show experiments where uh, we made the system to evolve, uh, to scramble between 100 spins, another case with 1,000 spins. That means two to the 1,000 states in the Hilbert space that we are connecting before making them to go backward in time, essentially. So we are measuring this. And uh, that's essentially it that, that's uh, I, I didn't learn too much from them, as, as you see. So essentially, some properties of the black hole and the, the such the Yekitaya model are similar in particular. Uh, in particular, the autocorrelators grow in time with this, this model, with, um, with, uh, with the rate which is related to the temperature. And then, uh, essentially, what about the black hole information paradox? The point is whether something that falls into the black hole, you, you, you measure the radiation later on. Can you reconstruct from the radiation of the black hole the state that has fallen into the black hole? So my point is that the system is already really chaotic in the sense that we are going to, to, to measure with the Loge Miteko. You will not be able to, um, uh, to recover the information that I'm going to show that this Scrambling. So the, the peop here the people are, are only concerned about scrambling, whether the information has distributed evenly in the, hood, uh, in the whole system. But what I'm going to say that scrambling is what prevents time reversal, makes your system very, very sensitive to infinitesimal perturbation, you will not be able to time reverse. That's uh, it's equivalent to do this, this, um, this cylinder. When you mix it too much, you will not be able to go back uh, in time. So there is a non-uniformity of the limits that I'm going to, to between the, the, um, the, the, the size of the perturbation and the time scale of the, your evolution. If you evolve too much for, for, a, for a, s a small, uh, uh, even if you make an evolution too long compared with uh, the strength of the perturbation, you are not going to be able to go back. There is this uniformity of the limits that we have been discussing in various talks from a different perspective that I'm going to try to get. Uh, and that's essentially was my wife. She passed away five uh, years ago, but we have been holding this project together. Uh, and many people have gone through this, uh, through this uh, project. Many of you may know CKFT and so on. Okay, but perhaps uh, one question that's in order to motivate. 